<clears throat> Dear friends, we're now in Luke chapter 1 and verses 57 through 66. Let's go ahead and read through that passage. And it says, Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. And on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him Zechariah after his father. But his mother answered, No, he shall be called John. And they said to her, None of your relatives is called by this name. And they made signs to his father inquiring what he wanted him to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, His name is John. And they all wondered. And immediately his mouth was opened, and his tongue was loosed, and he spoke, blessing God. And fear came on all their neighbors. And all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, What then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. This is a great moment, as it is a great moment in the lives of families when a new life is brought into this world. A new life that you are given the opportunity, the, the blessing to raise and to parent and to care for. That's what the Scriptures say of children, that they are a blessing of the Lord. They are a reward even. But even in this very normal but special activity, this one is unique. And the Lord does that. The Lord has been doing that. The Lord has been intervening into history for the salvation of His people since sin came into the world. And I would argue even this, He's been, even in eternity past, covenanting of this redemption, there were even beginning to see the first fruits of now at this time after Christ has ascended. Sometimes the Lord intervenes even into our plans. And we see this here. We, we kind of see a contrast. And there's, there's three aspects of this that I want to pull out of this passage and emphasize here. And first we see the, the miraculous versus the natural, that which would have been normal but special but important. We see miraculous at this time, miraculous in how the Lord had disciplined Zechariah and miraculous in the way in which John was conceived and even, as we've seen, as John has behaved even in utero. The smallest prophet ever. We, we mentioned that many weeks back. John is one who was declaring the glory of Christ even in his mother's womb, jumping even whenever Mary had walked into the room. Secondly, we see the commandment versus the custom. There was a custom of this day that was ordinary, that was regular. It was a good custom. It was a fine custom. Customs can be completely appropriate and something that you shouldn't necessarily seek to change. But the Lord intervened here, and the Lord was changing the custom. The Lord was declaring, this will be done differently at this time. And thirdly, we see the sign versus the status quo. This wouldn't be normal. This wouldn't be an ordinary birth because this wouldn't be an ordinary man because this would be a man, a great prophet who would be heralding the Messiah who would come forward and he would be heralding him up into his death. So let's start at that, that first point. We see the miraculous versus the natural, the miraculous versus the natural. In verses 57 and 58, it says, Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son, and her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. Now, now they're celebrating during this time. It's really common to be celebrating uh, someone's birth. I mean, we fool ourselves, or rather our culture fools itself, 
when it says that a pregnant woman merely has her own body within her body or says that this is merely a clump of cells. It so clearly is not. Even those that will declare, no, this is just a mere clump of cells, this is just an extension of your own body, will contradict that at other times. Such people attend baby showers and go and celebrate this life inside of another person and speak of that other person inside of his mother as though he is, in fact, another person, because, in fact, he is another person. And that same person will contradict herself, contradict himself when he goes and speaks of the right to remove that life, declaring that person to be nothing but a clump of cells or, 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 or nothing but an extension of the body of the mother. It is right to celebrate the life in the womb. It is right to, to celebrate a birth. And the celebration of a birth is something that was very common in this day. Sadly, it had its own issues even in this day. There would be bands that would be hired to celebrate the birth of a child. And it is recorded that when there was a boy that was born, there would be great celebration. There would be musicians that would be playing, and then at times when a female was born, the musicians would just put away their instruments and go home. There wouldn't be the same celebration. All cultures have their issues. All cultures have their inconsistencies. For even that culture, it's not even seeing that this boy that you're celebrating came from a woman. That even the Messiah when he came into this world, came through a woman. It was the man that was kept out of the picture as we've already walked through that passage. There's probably many people at this event as well. I'll go out and... What had happened with Zechariah was no small thing. This is something that had gathered a lot of attention. This is something that many people had noticed they were older, and she was pregnant. Nobody expected her to be pregnant. She is one who was beyond the time that would have been normal for her to be pregnant. This was a miraculous conception, although in other ways it was a, a normal conception. And so it's quite reasonable that there are people that had traveled the distance to be here during this time. There was a crowd here during that time, and all of that is happening providentially, intentionally, by the Lord. The Lord is heralding, even now, through these events that we see here, the Messiah who is going to come forward, this Messiah that had been prophesied, this one that would come forward and crush the head of the serpent, this one that would lead his people out of their slavery to sin, this one who would be the mediator between God and man, this one that Moses spoke of, and said that there will be a prophet like me who will come forward, and you should listen to him. So the Lord is stirring the waters at this time. The Lord is getting the attention of the people at this time, and they're seeing all of this. And this is a blessing. This is a good thing. And I pray you would see that as well. I pray you would see even the birth of a child is something that is a good thing, something that is a blessing. We live in a culture that looks down on motherhood, that looks down on, on those even that, that have children, they, they, looking at children as though they are a burden, looking at children as though they are a distraction from your goals, your hopes and dreams and all you would want to do in your life. That is an error that we have in our day. Psalm 127, verse 3 says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. So we must not say that that which is a reward is not a reward. We must not say that that which the Scriptures say is a blessing is, in fact, not a blessing. And it was the opposite for them in this culture in this day. Being barren was something that was a stigma. It was something that was a difficulty for them. And this is a blessing that they have now. It's a very special, special time. 
that they are walking through. And it's during this time that they bring the child forward and they will circumcise the child. This was by the law to be done on the eighth day. This was prescribed in such a way that even on the Sabbath, this was to be done. This could not be put away. This is miraculous. The Lord has blessed them with this child. Even in their older, older days, the Lord has blessed them with this child miraculously. We must remember as well, there's another miracle that is kind of hiding in the shadows at this time, and that is the miracle of the discipline of Zechariah. He's been disciplined during this time. He was one that was not trusting the word of the Lord. He was not, not believing what the angel Gabriel had declared to him. And the Lord's used this miracle at this time to take away his speech, to take away his hearing, that he could spend some time reflecting, spend some time reflecting upon that which he's likely proclaimed so many times in his life as a priest. In his silence, he, he's learning much about the Lord during this time, and the Lord's working in him now. The Lord's blessing him now, even in this difficulty, even in this, this discipline. It's an encouragement I want to give you there, dear friends. Discipline is something that is good. It is something that is a blessing from the Lord. It is, it is, it is something that is there to accomplish God's purpose within you. Don't waste your discipline. Don't take discipline and try to justify yourself and your circumstances. Look at the discipline that the Lord gives to you, the consequences even of your own actions, and imagine what the Lord would have you learn from this. How would the Lord have you to change? Don't kick against the goads. You remember that phrase from the Old Testament. It's the idea of like there's a farmer and he's got oxen in front of him and he had a pointy stick and he would goad the oxen so that they would go straight. It's very important that the oxen go and they go straight. If they're going different directions, it's not going to be beneficial to them. My, my children have been participating in farming lately, and one of the things that they learn in farming is things have to be in straight lines. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to walk down the field and harvest your crops. You're going to be stepping all over the items. You're not going to be able to keep things in an orderly way, and so that oxen needed to go straight, and there was a reason why the farmer was even goading him. If, if he didn't go straight, then you wouldn't end up with crops. You wouldn't end up with um, anything that they could eat. That oxen would, may even end up starving because there wasn't sufficient food even to feed him. The discipline that the farmer is doing at that time is good even for the oxen. He doesn't understand it. It's not relevant that he does fully understand it. It's relevant that he recognizes this discipline. And so it is for us, dear friends. Don't waste these times. Don't waste these opportunities. Use even the small amounts of discipline, even the times when the, when the Lord will bring something to your mind that you can come to an understanding of something that you have been ignoring for so long. You and your pride have been thinking higher of yourself than you should. You've been thinking that you, you know more than you do. You've been fooling yourselves. Use the blessing of the Lord in discipline for your good, for the Lord is doing these things because He loves you. It does not seem loving to you what the Lord did to Zechariah, but it is. It is. He is bringing to his understanding the problem in lacking faith, the danger in lacking faith, the danger in not trusting the Lord who has given him life, has given him speech, is using the speech the Lord gives to him to contradict the word of the Lord. So the Lord took his speech away for a little while. The Lord took his hearing away for a little while, and he did it so that he would hear rightly and so that he would speak rightly. So we see this contrast of the, the miraculous versus the natural. We're seeing the miraculous here in the conception of John, in the birth of John. And secondly, we also see the miraculous there in the discipline that Zechariah received. And it's getting the attention of the people. The Lord is beginning to work even during this time to, to, to get things ready, to, to, to stir things up, to, to, to break people out of their comforts. 
that they would see the error that they have in this day, that they would even begin to see the idolatry that is there in present at this time, though it's not like the idolatry of the past. You will not find the high places. You will not find the Asherah poles. You will not find people uh, lifting up their children to Molech. You will not find people worshiping Baal. But there is an idolatry of self-righteousness that is ubiquitous amongst the Jewish people at this time in the first century. And John is going to be pivotal in calling the people to repentance, calling them to repent, calling them to see first and foremost the seriousness of their sins. That's the first step. You must see the seriousness of your sins. Oh, friends, you, you must know the bad news if you are to ever know the good news. So we see the miraculous versus the natural. And secondly, we, we see the commandment versus the custom. The commandment versus the custom in verses 59 through 61. It says, And on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him Zechariah after his father. But his mother answered, No, he shall be called John. And they said to her, None of your relatives is called by that name. Have you ever thought about naming someone and what that is communicating? This is something that parents spend a lot of time on doing. When, when, when the mother is pregnant, the mother and the father will spend many nights, many of you have done this, going through the different names, what, what, what should we name the child? And at this time, it was not even like it is now. You didn't have the benefit of an ultrasound. So they probably had two lists of names, if we'll be honest. And some of you don't utilize the ultrasound, and you keep yourself two listed names as well, trying to think through these names. And normally you have a few months to really be thinking about this now. It does happen, as it happened in our family, where we had an opportunity to adopt someone and began to take someone into our household, and we had not made that list of names. And we began to use names that we came up with, and we started using the name, and we're like, that name's not working very well. I mean, they use a different name. So then we used a different name, and that caused, as Luke would say, no small controversy in my household, because I had some children that were like, wait a second, we've been calling the child this name. You can't just change the name. Well, actually, I can. Actually, well, I'm just going to call that child. No, you're not. You're going to call the child the name that we have chosen to call the child. And why is that? Why is it that parents have the authority to name their children? Well, it's because they have authority over that child. That's why you are given the right to name that child. Now, be careful if you ever begin to exist under a government that begins to pick the names of your children for you. That's communicating something there. Think of this even back in the garden. All right? One of the jobs that Adam was given was to name the animals. Okay? This is demonstrating his authority over them. He had authority over these animals. Adam and Eve were to rule over the garden. They were to rule over this world. Let's be honest. In all of our science, all right, in, in all of our great and deep understandings, that's all we're still really doing. We're, we're naming things. We're basically doing two things. We're discovering things, all right, and we're naming them, or we are making something out of what's already there. I mean, we don't actually ever make anything new. We don't actually create something. This is what the Lord has given to us, and we are identifying it, we're naming it, and then we're making something else out of it. But that which is there is already there. And so God is naming this child here. This is where I'm going with this. God is naming this child here because he is designating that he has a special purpose for this child, that this child here has a special purpose in God's redemptive plan. And there's a history of the Lord naming certain people at certain times to, to accomplish his purpose, or rather just to, to point out something or to communicate something. R.C. Sproul says this, basically, he's saying this, he says, your baby belongs to God 
His name will be given by God Himself. God has decreed that His name shall be John. And they have an issue here. They've been given this commandment, and the commandment that was given by Gabriel was that they were to name the baby John. And so, Elizabeth is being obedient here. She's saying his name shall be John, or he shall, she actually says, he shall be called John. It's Zechariah that comes forward and says, it says his name is John. But they come back to him and they say, wait a second, none of your relatives is called by that name. What are you doing here? How, 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 how could you do this? You know, it's, it's a tradition that they have. And I think of tradition, and, and, and I think of Jewish culture, and I can't not think of that great musical, Fiddler on the Roof, with Tevia dancing around and declaring tradition, singing, if I was a rich man. And he, even in one of his monologues, says, you know, you may ask where this tradition started. And he says, I tell you, I don't know but it's a tradition. They may not even know where this tradition started. Some of you have attended Texas A&M, a school replete with traditions. It is a tradition for them to have traditions. I would imagine there's even traditions they have that they don't even know why they have them. Vody gave a, an illustration a little while back, and he said there was there was someone that had made a roast, and they, they, the, the roast that they made was just like their grandmother had made it. And they went to make this roast, and they'd cut this end off, cut this end off, and they'd go, and they'd cook it. And they'd say, you know, that's, that's a really good roast. Why, why do you cut the ends off? It's like, well, I don't know. My mother always did it. Okay, so that person goes and asks the mother and says, well, I love how the roast, it's excellent. I love how your daughter makes it, but why do you cut the ends off it? She says, I don't know. My grandmother always did it. So he goes and asks the grandmother and says, you know, the, the roast that, that, that your granddaughter makes and your daughter makes, they're, they're absolutely fantastic. I love the recipe. I just don't understand why do you cut the ends off of the roast? And she says, well, I, my pan was never big enough, so I always cut the ends off of it. That is, we, we don't always know why we have certain traditions, and, and it's appropriate to have traditions in culture. But it's more important that you follow the commands of God. And, and so, if, if your tradition, if your custom is contradicting a command, it's something that absolutely has to change. And this is something that we've erred in in missions at times, where they've tried to keep certain cultures, where they've tried to allow people to use certain names for God, which have connotations in that culture that are not going to be appropriate for Christianity. And so, there, there needs to be kind of a difficulty at times, because the truth of Christ is something that is going to contradict errors in culture, and the errors that you have in a culture are going to be different depending on which culture that you're in. And this is something here that was surprising to the people, possibly even offensive to the people. I mean, seriously, Elizabeth, how could you? I mean, after all Zechariah has been through, he's lost his hearing, he's lost his speech, and you're going to take from him even now the, the, the opportunity to name his son I mean, it, all these years he's wanted a son, he's prayed for a son, he's finally now getting a son, and you're going to take that away from him? You're going to go and name him a name that no one in your family is named? I mean, it's possible. It's been eight days here. People had already been calling the baby little Zachariah, little, little Zachary. Probably calling him that on the way in. Just looking forward to this time when the father will get to name the child. It was common in this day for them to maybe give the, the name that the grandfather had. It could be the father, but generally it was someone within the family. But this was unheard of. This was unheard of for the child to get a name that no one in the family held. But it wasn't really, now was it? It, it, it wasn't unheard of in redemptive history. 
All right? It wasn't unheard of within the Old Testament. This is something that Zechariah needed to remember. Zechariah asked, how can this happen? How is it that my wife and I can have a child? Really? Are, are, you, are you a child of Abraham? Have you forgotten that story that you have told to so many people? Have you forgotten this message that has been communicated throughout the ceremonial system in Israel? See, they're battling here a custom versus a command. Zechariah there was battling that which is natural versus that which is miraculous, forgetting from where the miracles came. You're talking to an angel. An angel has appeared to you there when you're bringing the, the incense offering into the holy place. And you're asking him, how is this going to happen? God commanded them to name the child John. The custom was good. It was reasonable. It was appropriate. It served a purpose even. And I'll say that. This tradition served a good purpose in heralding in the Messiah. This tradition that they had here was good in God's plan here because in God going contrary to their custom, it was drawing attention to this child. It was beginning to herald in the Messiah by bringing prominence to John in pointing to him. They wouldn't have seen that significance. If there, this custom didn't exist, then they could have named him John, and they would have said, okay. His name's John. It wouldn't have been anything special. That would have been it. So the Lord used even this here for His good purpose. But it is crucial, dear friends, it is crucial that we in the church recognize where we are culturally. It is important that we, even in church history, see where we are and see the, the, the influences that we have been influenced by. What are the customs that we are used to in this culture that contradicts, contradict commandments from God? I'd say there's a great many of them. We could spend a, a very long time walking through different cultural practices in the church and within our culture that, that contradict the, the teachings of Scripture, that, that do not rightly support what we're called to do as a church. It can be difficult even at times to, to, to go contrary to this. You know, it's hard to even see. It was hard for me the first time that I walked into a Reformed Baptist church, and there was no altar call at the end of the service. I thought that was odd. Well, how are you going to share the gospel? How are you going to bring other people to Jesus? Well, there was no sinner's prayer giving at the end of it either. How are they going to come to Christ? What are they supposed to do even when they come to faith in Christ? What are they going to say? What card are they going to fill out? What Bible are you going to give them with a date on it? I was so used to these things and many, many, many services standing there for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, sometimes 45 minutes. You know, one more stanza, every head bowed, every eye closed, repeat after me. Can I, can I just get a hand up? Even those that didn't walk down the aisle, it'd just be, can I, can I just get a hand? Can someone just, just wink at me? And then I began to see that these were practices that, when I read through the New Testament for the first time, I was surprised. Where's the sinner's prayer? I don't see the sinner's prayer. What are you supposed to do? They didn't have these altar calls. They didn't have these, these activities that I was so accustomed to growing up in a Southern Baptist church even during Revival Week, where we'd call Revival Week and have a special person come in and do these very long, extended altar calls, singing the same song repetitively, dimming the lights, sending the counselors down first. You've been there, some of you. I know you're nodding. And I was surprised to find out this practice is very recent. This hasn't been going on a long time. This is something that started by a man named Charles Finney in the 19th century. The sinner's prayer really began to, you know, have its growth going through the 1950s and then into the Jesus movement in the 1970s. And with each of these practices, 
what you have is you have a, a breaking away from church tradition, and you have a breaking away from what, what the Scriptures tell us to do, that you are called to come to faith in Christ, to believe upon Christ. But you, you're not to try to manipulate people psychologically. We're, we're not to try to woo people in. That, that's an error that we've had in so many aspects of this culture where our desire is to do whatever it is the culture is interested in and try to woo them into the church with that. No, dear friends, that which you draw people in with to the church is that which you're going to need to do to keep them there. And if you're drawing them in with entertainment, it's usually a cheap form of whatever entertainment there is in the culture already, the cheap form of whatever movies that are there. You've seen the sermon series where someone will walk through an Avengers sermon series or a Star Wars sermon series. These are just cheap imitations even of what you would get if you had just gone to the theater and watched Star Wars or gone to the theater and watched the Avengers. It's not beneficial to the people. There's other cultural activities that we have that have crept into the church. I would say this as well, like these services that have an overarching patriotic emphasis. These churches, there's one in particular in Dallas that every single year they will have flags all over the place. They will stand up. They will sing, God bless America. They will pledge allegiance to the flag. And I think of something like that, and I think of, of our church here and the cultural diversity that is here, and we have people that have come into this church from countries all over the world, Pe people that are gathered here in this context now. Yes, we do live in the United States, and so there is a cultural context that is significant there in that this is where we are. But the purpose for gathering here transcends this culture. It transcends the Constitution in this culture. It, it, it transcends this country. This country, the Lord could remove this country as He has so many other empires in the past, and the church will continue. There is no basis ever regardless of how used to people are in a culture, to doing a so-called patriotic service, to be doing that in the church. The Lord says He's gathered people from every tongue, every tribe, every nation, not gathering together to, to salute a flag, not gathering together to, to listen to the President of the United States or former President of the United States speak there as the people of God are gathered together especially one that's not clearly not a Christian. We, we've, we, we've, we have, for so many years in this country, had church growth strategies that are striving, that, that are seeking to do whatever is popular in the culture at the time, whatever the zeitgeist is of this day and of this time. And you could still be orthodox and do that. It was a horrible way to practice the church. It was not how we should be ordering the Lord's day. It was feeding goats rather than sheep. There's many problems with it. But the reality is there was enough influence of Christianity within the culture that you could still be an Orthodox church and do these terrible church growth methods. But we are coming to a time even now where those methods are falling to pieces, where the culture is in very much of a post-Christian decline going a direction, not, not holding to normal Christian principles, not having even a cultural Christianity. And so to continue with this strategy of seeking to draw people in with the customs of that day, of the traditions of that day, of that which people desire in that day, to do those things, to draw people in with what the world is desiring and the culture at the time, Many people are having to declare things that are not even Christian. They're having to make statements that are not even orthodox. We have many, many issues in our day, and we must be grounded in the Scriptures. We must look to the commands because there are churches all over the country that are compromising, compromising in a biblical understanding of the blessing of children a right understanding of abortion, that abortion is actually taking the life of another person, that which is clear, settled scientifically. You, you give all the names you want 
But it is clear from a scientific standpoint, looking at DNA, that this is a person, that you are taking the life of a person. And you begin to take these stances as a church that contradict the life of another person. You will have your, can, you will have your lampstand removed. Again, another one that we're walking into during this time. So much of this looking to the culture, trying to replicate the culture. We live in a day where there's confusion even over who is a man and, and who is a woman. This week in particular. This week in particular, there is a man who won the women's NCAA 500-yard swimming championship. Came in first place. There was a celebration going all around, and there was an odd response an odd response from the crowd where this man stood up and took his first place trophy and the woman stood up and she took her second place and the entire crowd began to celebrate. Even they were seeing the air in this. We're seeing those that are Christians, those that are Christian leaders seeking to contradict this, seeking to not even recognize these categories that God has given in our day. Customs are fine. Traditions are fine so long as they are not contradicting a commandment of God. It is the Word of God which is where we must go to derive our truth on what God says about us and what God says about Him. It's not up to our opinion. We don't get to do what is easier at that time. We must trust in the Word of God. So we've seen the miraculous versus the natural. We've seen the commandment versus the custom. And then thirdly, we've seen the sign versus the status quo. And we see that in verses 62 through 66. It says, And they made signs to his father inquiring what he wanted him to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, His name is John. And they all wondered. And immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed and he spoke, Blessing God. And fear came on all their neighbors. And all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid them in their hearts, saying, What then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. His name is John. That's the declaration that Zechariah gave when he, he wrote it down. And there was great unity there between Elizabeth and Zechariah. It's important, dear friends. It, it is, it, there was a need to stand up for the command that God had given during this time. It was important that He backed her up during this time. And there's times even, friends, you, you will see this, that you have family members that are here. You, you have relatives that are gathered here that, that, are, that are possibly beginning to guilt trip them at this time. Well, wh why would you do it this way? No one in our family has the name John Look at what you're, you're doing to our family at this time. There's times, dear friends, where you will need to back up your spouse in talking to a family member. You know, men, sometimes you're going to need to talk to your mother or your father and defend your, your wife respectfully, appropriately. But there may be things that you're doing in your household that are different from what your parents did. And you may have to sit down and have a conversation. You may have to, to stand up for that which is appropriate here, not the status quo at this time, all right? But rather, that, that which is commanded by God. Instruction is something that is important for you to receive, even as husband and wife from other family members. Your parenting doesn't completely end once you grow up, once you're out of the house, once you have a family it's important to have open communication and to be talking one to another. But it's also important that you, as husband and wife, recognize what the Word of God says. What is the Word of God commanding here? And you must come to an agreement. You must see this reality. And you must stand firm on these truths. You must be willing to stand up to those in the culture, those neighbors that may be there saying, why are you doing things this way? Don't you know other people do this? You may get guilt tripped. Why don't you do? What, was there something wrong with what we did? You don't necessarily have to answer that question. You can really say, we're doing it this way. 
Because the Bible says this. And they were commanded at this time. They were commanded to call his name John. So they were not to appease the family. There were going to be hurt feelings at this part, at this point. But those, those feelings went from hurt feelings to fear really quickly when Zechariah began to speak. There was a sign that was there rather than the status quo, rather than what was normal. God's redemptive work was breaking in amongst the status quo of this community. He was doing His work even here, shining a light. There had been silence. The Lord had been speaking through the silence of Zechariah throughout these months. And the Lord had been speaking, I will say this, even through the silence prophetically that there had been so far. That there had been 400 years of silence from Malachi all the way unto this point where Gabriel arrives on the scene and talks to Zechariah and talks to Mary. And then the Lord intervenes during this part and even giving him back his speech. The Lord is accomplishing His work providentially. The Lord has decreed that which He will do, but He's providentially bringing it about in creation and providence. And each of these prophets of the past that were speaking of this Messiah to come from Enoch all the way through Malachi, the Lord's now speaking of this even here through John, even here as Zechariah is beginning to speak. Zechariah speaking is pointing to John, and the greatness of John is pointing, pointing even to the greater one, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is going to come forward and accomplish all that is necessary to save his people, this, this greater Moses that will come forward, this greater Israel. And you have this phrase there at the end, it says, for the hand of the Lord was with him. And this is, this is a phrase that has a long history in the Old Testament. You, you can find it used over 200 times in the Old Testament. You see it especially being used during the time of the Exodus, when the Lord was saving the people out of slavery to Egypt, when the Lord was working redemptively in the lives of His people through great signs and wonders during this time, defeating the gods of Egypt to show the greatness of the Lord, to show the greatness of of the true God, the God of Israel, the one who is saving His people. This isn't a phrase that you see many times in the New Testament unless it's applying to something in the Old Testament. So I think Luke is very intentionally using the wording here, pointing that this miracle of Elizabeth giving birth during this time when she was barren and also Zechariah losing his speech and his hearing is something that is pointing forward to this long history of redemptive work that the Lord has been doing for His people. That is what the people have been trusting in. All of the ceremonies of the law were pointing to Christ. They were all pointing to this piece in history. That's why it was a big deal when Zechariah didn't believe. That's why it was significant When Abraham wasn't trusting God and and saying that Sarah was his wife, I mean, saying rather Sarah was his his sister and not his wife, he's not believing the promise that God had given, that God's not big enough to protect him from this king. He already said, this is what's going to happen. Abraham needed to believe it. Zechariah, likewise, was not believing, but he's confessing it now. He's, he's remembering the promises of God. Let's review what happened just, just a few verses back there in verse 11. And it says, And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to wisdom, the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared 
That's the great statement. That's, that's the great declaration that is made. But then Zechariah says to the angel, how shall I know this? For I'm an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. I love that response. So, how am I going to do this? How am I going to know this? I'm old. My wife is old. Gabriel doesn't mean He just said, I am, angel. I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of the Lord. doesn't even answer his question. You don't need to worry about that. You just need to believe this. He says, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. Zechariah did not believe that message when it was given to him. But over these, these months, over these times of silence where he has not been able to hear, where he has not been able to speak, he has had time to think and to reflect. And I think as a priest, he, he's one who was there for decades serving in this ministry, working there within the ceremonial law, working there within the temple, walking through the different sacrifices, teaching redemptive history in his household, teaching the great redemptive history of the Lord, which was demonstrated through these different festivals, and teaching this history even to the people. He had been teaching the story to others. He had told others about the miracle that the Lord had done with Abraham and Sarah. He had told the people about the miracle of what the Lord had done in Egypt in saving the people as they walked through the Red Sea, as the armies of Pharaoh were defeated, as the Israelites walked out, walked out of Egypt with the Egyptians just throwing, throwing their possessions at them. Just, just take our gold. Just leave we don't want any more. He's teaching these things to them. It's there each and every year in the Passover. There each and every year in, in, the fe in the Feast of Tabernacles, celebrating these things that the Lord has done. But when it was said to him, when it came to him, he didn't believe the Lord could do it. He wasn't certain that the Lord could accomplish. He'd been saying these things, but he wasn't rightly Believing these things. That's what I want for you, dear friends. I want for you not to have a faith that is, is merely spoken. There's a great many of you that can answer catechism questions. There's a great many of you that can give right answers. But to what degree does your faith influence your life? To what degree does your faith affect how you order things? Where is your trust? Do you really believe what the Scriptures say of the Lord? Do you believe that the Lord has saved His people? Did He save the people miraculously out of Egypt? The Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ has come down. That He clothed Himself in flesh. That He lived a perfect life, never sinned took upon himself the wrath of God, was raised three days later, ascended and sits at the right hand of the Father. Do you really speak these things or do you, do you believe them? Have you been changed? Have you been affected? Do, do you even see your need for this? Perhaps Zechariah is kind of going through the motions. He's, he's walking through the self-righteousness of the day. He's seeing the ways in which the leadership is, you know, ruling as they are, and he's not seeing his own sins. He's not seeing the, the errors that are even there. My dear friends, for each of us individually, it is crucial, absolutely crucial, absolutely necessary that you understand the bad news, that you understand your, your need of this redemptive work that you are not like those that justify themselves by comparing themselves to others. That they look and they say, at least I'm not like this person. I haven't killed anyone. I haven't done this. And it does absolutely nothing to justify yourself before the Lord. What does it matter? 
If you have done something that is good for someone else, when you have sinned before the Lord, does that make you clean? Does that make you righteous? Just the fact that you can't find anyone that's perfect make it okay for you to sin before the Lord? See, that's the real issue with each and every one of us, and each and every one of us have got to see the seriousness of our sins. You've got to see that the wages of sin is death. That is the reality. That, that, that is the declaration. After sin, man began to die. This is the curse of God, but God showed mercy. God showed mercy that mankind wasn't completely annihilated, but... Instead, the Lord began to work redemptively. The Lord made a promise that He would send a Messiah and communicated this throughout redemptive history. But it does you no good if you don't see your need. Jesus does you no good if you don't see your need of Him. If you're coming to Him like the rich young ruler asking, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And then listing off all the things that you've done. I haven't done this, I haven't done this, I haven't done this. What does Jesus say to him? Why do you call me good? Why do you call me good? Are, are you attributing your standard of good to the Son of God? Your standard of good where you just justify yourself by comparison? At least I'm not like this. I'm not a terrorist. I'm not a suicide bomber. What kind of a standard of righteousness is that? It's no standard at all. The wages of sin is death. And when we speak of the wages of sin being death, Paul is talking about not just physical death. He's talking about an eternal death. He's talking about the one who dies in their sins will sit under the wrath of God for all eternity. That is what is just. That is what is good. Some will say, I just want what I got coming to me. You don't want what you have coming to you. You don't want your wages. You go to work. You make money. That's your wages. You sin. Your wages are death. See, but there is grace in Christ Jesus because Jesus never sinned in any respect. He kept the law perfectly in every aspect, even from the heart, which is what the law talks about. It says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. That is the summary of the summary of the law. And Jesus took upon himself the consequences of sin this is his passive obedience. He took upon himself the full consequences of sin. The wrath of God fell upon Jesus. And he died in our stead. He was raised to life. And you can have life as well if you will believe upon him. If you will see your sin, the seriousness of your sin, if you will repent and turn to Jesus. It's like an about face. This is what I'm trusting in. I'm trusting in this world. I'm trusting in my efforts. I'm going to turn the other direction and trust in Christ. That is my prayer for you, dear friends, that you would see your need of Christ, that you would turn to Christ Jesus and believe upon Him. And in Christ Jesus, there is life. In Christ Jesus, there is hope. In Christ Jesus, there is salvation. There's plenty of grace in Christ Jesus. As we said earlier, nothing but the blood. Christ is sufficient. No longer do you need to lean upon yourself, lean upon your own efforts, lean upon your best efforts, your best deeds. You must just believe upon Christ and trust in Him. And Christ is sufficient to save his people. In Christ, there is great grace and great grace indeed for all who come to him. Let's pray.